Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills is where I talk about the books that I have recently read. Uh, I'm really mostly sticking to things that I've completed. And since the last time I made one of these videos, it's been a few weeks, I finished, um, I think, five books, uh, and I'm a good way through another one. Uh, so I'm going to split this up into two different parts, which I've been doing lately when I have, uh, you know, several books to talk about. I try not to have my videos be too long, so I'd rather have a couple shorter videos rather than one that's like a half hour or something like that. Um, so I'm going to talk about three in this part, and then I'll talk about two more in part two. Um, so for part one, I'm going to be talking first about uh, Gothic Histories, The Taste for Terror, six, er, sorry, 1764 to the Present by Clive Bloom. And the other two uh, books that I'm going to talk about this episode are also history books. Um, so this one, you know, I have a, I have a, a lifelong interest in horror. Uh, I really love the Gothic. I love the Gothic aesthetic. Um, I am, uh, kind of currently, uh, periodically, I would say every few months or so, um, myself and, uh, Mark from Book Time with Elvis, and, uh, we're sometimes being joined by some others as well. Uh, we are looking at Gothic literature from the 18th century through the 19th century. Um, and we've read a couple so far. We read uh, The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe back in December. Um, at some point coming up, I don't know exactly when yet, we'll be reading uh, Matthew Lewis's The Monk. Uh, so I want to learn more about the Gothic. And especially, I'm especially interested in how the kind of Gothic transitioned into what we would today call horror. And I was hoping that this book would give me some insight into that. I do love that that cover image there. Um, and this is from Continuum. It's not a very big book. It's a little under 200 pages. And um, it mostly does what I want it to do. Um, it does trace Gothic beginnings from the 18th century up to the present day. Uh, it focuses on literature. Um, it looks at drama. And then, of course, in the end, it starts to look at... Um, film and some also some lifestyle things as well uh i knew a lot about the film stuff i knew some stuff about the literature and i knew pretty much nothing about the drama aspects so i definitely did learn quite a bit from this book um it's not without its drawbacks i think though uh i don't know if bloom he doesn't always have a a clarity of writing um when we're transitioning especially from like maybe one paragraph to the other uh the transition is not always clear and I feel like I'm kind of playing catch up sometimes exactly why he's going to this part uh you know uh, from where he just was uh essentially um he has a tendency to just kind of give us block quotes without any sort of um background as to who is saying it um and that can get a little bit jarring. Like, for instance, he might introduce a figure from the 1700s and then follow up that information from that person by a block quote, uh, with a block quote. And you kind of assume that block quote is going to be from that person from the 1700s. But it's not. It's like a, a 21st century quote from somebody talking about him. Um, but I have you have to go look in the end notes to see who's even saying it. So the writing, I thought, could have been handled with way more clarity um, and just went more smoothly. Uh, I also did, I did notice a couple of errors uh, when it came to the film section. Uh, for instance, talking about how the zombie revival happened in the 1950s, when no, it was like the end of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, yeah, he even mentions malls being ravaged. Uh, that definitely was not the 1950s. Um, little things like that. Uh, and I wouldn't know if, I wouldn't know if I would call it an error, but um, I didn't understand he doesn't justify it, but he does refer to Edison's 1910 Frankenstein, um, the 15-minute film, uh, as the first horror film. And I'm not sure why he's calling that the first horror film. Uh, some people would put that date at 1896, so you've got 14 years in between with a lot of other, uh, you know, candidates as well. So I'm not sure why he would refer to that as the first horror film. So it does make me wonder if there were errors in the literature aspect uh, sections and the drama sections that I just don't have enough information, you know, uh, enough background information to 
pick up on those errors. Uh, so, you know, I definitely learned some things from this book, but um, I do wish that it had, had a little more clarity to it. And, uh, you know, on top of that, there were, there were quite a few um, errors, um, not just factual, but grammatical, uh, you know, typographic, which gets frustrating after a while. They, they, they were pretty continuous throughout, um, which is, you know, unfortunate. This is a, essentially an academic book. Um, you know, this is, <sighs> unfortunately, I do read a lot of academic books that still have a lot of errors uh, when, when they really shouldn't. So um, I kind of could tentatively recommend this to people who want to know more about the Gothic, but um, there might be better stuff out there that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, one of the next books that I read um, was something that's definitely outside of my my expertise, uh, and I wasn't sure how I was going to do when I began reading it, uh, and that is The Origins of Monsters, um, Image and Cognition in the First Age of Mechanical Reproduction by David Wengro, uh, who is an archaeologist. And uh, this is not a very, it's not a very big book. Um, you know, it clocks, really the main text clocks in and over little over 100 pages. Um, and with that, you also have, um, I'll show you some, yeah, large sections with, with images um, throughout. So it's not that it was a slow read at all, uh, but this is definitely not written for a general audience. Um, he is writing to other archaeologists. And uh, I know I was in trouble when he'd say, oh, you know, the well-known or the famous, this and that, I'll mention an artifact. And I have never heard of these things, but uh, he's assuming that his audience is very well aware of some of the things he's bringing up. And he's also bringing up theories um, that I'm not familiar with, uh, famous archaeologists of the past um, that he is discussing uh, without all too much introduction that I also don't have a background in. Um, but I think I was able to follow the general theme of this. And uh, basically what he's talking about is the rise of what he calls... I mean, they're, they're called monsters in the title. He very quickly drops that for uh, composite figures. Um, and essentially, you're talking about these creatures, we could say, which are, they're, they're made from different parts of different animals. Okay, I think like a griffin or a sphinx or something like that, you know, and also humans who have animal parts to them. And he's tracing that with mechanical reproduction, which I didn't quite understand what that meant at first. But one example that I think he's talking about is... Uh, he shows basically a wax seal that was a cylinder that would be used by the government. And I, I should mention, sorry, this is uh, mostly Bronze Age that he's talking about. He's talking about this is ancient, ancient Middle East. Um, you would use that cylinder as like a wax seal, uh, and it would have these composite figures on it. So that's the sort of thing I think he means by a composite, by a mechanical reproduction. So he's looking at that, especially with the growth of urban environments in places like Mesopotamia, Egypt, um, in, in those areas, okay, the, the mostly Bronze Age, he does do a little bit of Neolithic, uh, but mostly Bronze Age Middle East, and, um, overall, I thought this was quite interesting, uh, I'm definitely, again, I, I'm sure that there were things that just kind of went over my head because I didn't have the context for it, um, one of the things that he, he kind of raises that I thought was an interesting idea was, uh, this is also the point, you know, we're talking about composite figures, um, creating this sort of fantastical, uh, you know, menagerie of creatures. But this also seems to coincide with a time when they were making items from, uh, from composites. Like, think like a, like a vase or a clay jug or something like that, where the bottom would be made separately, the handles would be made separately, the top, and then you would kind of all put it all together. So once human beings were able to see the things that they created in, in composite parts, they then looked at nature and started kind of playing with that idea of taking one thing from here and one thing from there and, and putting them together. Um, so that's one of the things that stood out to me with this that I thought was quite interesting. And he does go into a little bit of background to some of these, uh, some of these creatures, I guess you could say, or these composite figures. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, it, I'm, it's a quick read. I'm glad I read it. But um, I'm definitely not the target audience for it. Uh, you know, when I when I'd gotten this actually at a, at a on a sale uh, that Princeton University was having, and I thought, oh, this looks 
right up my alley. I love horror studies. <laughs> uh, but I also love ancient history, so I figured this would be a really cool uh, marriage of those two things. It's definitely much more about ancient archaeology than it is anything uh, really about monsters at all. Uh, but still, very, very interesting book. But um, I'd only recommend it for people who are really into archaeology. Um, and as sort of a transition from uh, gothic studies to Bronze Age monsters. Uh, I read this as well. Um, and this is uh, Ancient Greece from Prehistoric to Hellenistic Times by Thomas R. Uh, Martin. And I've had this on my shelf for years. I believe that there is actually a second edition of this now. This is from Yale University Press. Um, this one came out, I think, was it late 90s originally? 1996. So, um, older, you know, obviously the second edition, I think, has is updated. It's got a more illustrations, more maps, and all of that, but uh, I just needed to kind of bone up on my ancient history. Um, last summer, I had participated in a group read where we read Herodotus, and uh, I had read the landmark Herodotus, and it reminded me how much I love reading about this era, and also how long it had been since I had done so. Um, really, not since I was an undergrad, uh, well over 15 years ago, had I really read stuff about ancient Greece, and really Rome for that matter. Um, so I'm just beginning, actually today, as I film this, this is the day that uh, I am beginning a buddy read with um, Mark from Book Time with Elvis and also Stephanie Cohen, where we are reading uh, Thucydides and his account of the Peloponnesian War. And I didn't know enough about the Peloponnesian War. I knew some stuff about the Persian War, which Herodotus dealt with, but Peloponnesian was... Um, I knew it was Sparta and Athens fighting. That's about all that I really knew. Uh, so I realized how long it had been since, since I had, um, <clears throat> excuse me, read things about ancient Greece and, uh, that I needed to bone up, uh, on, on that. So I picked this one up, uh, off my shelf and read it. And I gotta say, this is a really good introduction. Uh, I think this is designed, I think, especially for, um, for undergraduate students, uh, who are first being introduced to to ancient Greece, and um, he does a really good job of giving you a survey history of about a thousand year period. Um, he goes into, of course, the military aspects, uh, gives us some details of the wars, like the Persian War, like the Peloponnesian War, uh, the conquests of uh, Alexander the Great, um, but he also gives us cultural history, social history, he gives us stuff about uh, women's history as well, looks at the lives of, of slaves, he goes into the arts, um, the different writers of the time, the um, how the physical and visual art changed, uh, the philosophy of the era. So he gives you a really good, well-rounded picture in what's really like a little over 200 pages. Um, and there's also images within here as well, and uh, it's just a nice, nice uh, page design. And um, we also do get some maps, too. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I haven't read other single volume general histories of ancient Greece, so I don't have anything to compare this one against. Um, any other thing that I've read from that time period has been much more particular. Uh, like, I have books on ancient travel, ancient religion, uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but I don't have a lot of just general histories. Um, so this is certainly one of the first things that I've read, like I said, in almost two decades. Uh, and reading it was really kind of like, you know, being back at, at university as an undergrad and just trying to soak up as much as I can in, uh, in those history classes that I took. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would actually really recommend this. Of course, the, the second edition, which would be the updated version. Uh, but I thought this was an excellent introduction into the topic. So this is the three that I'm going to be talking about for, uh, for part one. Um, so for that, uh, like I said, I had read, uh, The Gothic Histories by Clive Bloom, um, Ancient Greece by Thomas Martin, and The Origins of Monsters by David Wingrow. Um, so... I will be talking about two more books in part two. Uh, so if you made it to the end of this video, thank you, BookTube.